Hi, everyone. Welcome to the closing keynote of FamilyCon 2022. I really hope that all of you have enjoyed your time this weekend and that you've learned more about CF and came away with new connections and new friends. I'd love to know what your favorite part of FamilyCon has been, so please let us know in the chat area under the stage tab. So as a reminder, my name's Alex Gant. I'm one of your co-chairs along with John Schroeder, and I'm incredibly honored to introduce you to this keynote. This is what CF looks like. Cystic fibrosis is not a one-size-fits-all disease, and the model of what CF is supposed to look like is completely outdated. People with CF are different nationalities, cultures, genders, and religions. They can be post-transplant, part of the LGBT community, doing great on modulators, or have a nonsense mutation and can't benefit from them. CF is often called an invisible disease, but it should never be invisible to others in the community. Whatever your connection to CF is, we want you to know that we see you. You are seen, you are heard and your story matters. With that being said, I'm pleased to introduce you to Amita, a mother of a teenager with CF who had quite an interesting journey getting a diagnosis for her daughter, and Mora, a 44-year-old wife and mom of twins living with CF after two double lung transplants. Take it away, Amita. Thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. I am really honored to be here to share our story. My name is Amita Mahajan, and I'm a CF mom to a daughter named Riddhi. My husband and I were born and raised in India, and we moved to U.S. in the 90s. Um, well, who is Riddhi? Riddhi is a 15-year-old high schooler who loves school. She likes spending time with her older brother. She participates in various sports just to enjoy them, whether or not she is good at them. Uh, she has a black belt in Taekwondo. She sings, plays guitar, ukulele, knits, and crochets cute little toys. Our family's uh, birthdays are incomplete without her beautiful handmade cards. She enjoys each and every moment of her precious life. She volunteers with the local CF Foundation chapter in a lot of ways to raise awareness and fundraising. She wants to study medicine and hopes to help a lot of people in the future. When I was pregnant with Riddhi in 2006, I remember filling out the questionnaire where one of the questions asked if I wanted to get screened for cystic fibrosis. I did not know what CF was at the time. Uh, the little description mentioned that it is most commonly found in Caucasian population, assuming um, it did not apply to us. I just checked no. Riddhi was born in December of 2006, um, and doctors noticed an abnormality. Um, her stomach was severely distended. Within the first 12 hours of her life, she had a major intestinal uh, surgery. Riddhi had twisted intestines, and the doctors took out a small piece of her intestine where it was knotted and thus ended up having uh, an ostomy. A month later, she was connected. Within the first year of her life, she actually had a total of five surgeries. Every time she would be obstructed, she would have a surgery. She displayed many symptoms commonly found in CF, such as malabsorption um, and frequent intestinal obstruction, obstructions. Unfortunately, no one thought of testing her for CF. Uh, now, this could be because CF was uh, uh, extremely rare in the Indian population. After all, it is found in one in 31,000 Asian Americans, making it extremely rare within this ethnic group. Riddhi spent almost six months in the NICU. My husband and I were fearful as to whether or not we would ever be able to bring Riddhi home. At the peak of our confusion, and not having a proper diagnosis added to our uh, unbearable stress and anguish we felt at the time. After about a year and a half, uh, we received a second opinion. The doctor recognized that Riddhi's problems went beyond the GI issues, and upon additional testing, she found out that Riddhi had cystic fibrosis. We were provided with genetic counseling and all the information about CF. And so our journey with CF began. Now, this diagnosis story shows that 
uh, CF is not limited to a specific race or ethnicity as was believed in the past. Um, now, 15 years into her life, Riddhi does her breathing treatments, takes many medications every day and ends, ends up being hospitalized multiple times in, uh, during a year. But that is all a part of living with CF. CF may be a big part of her life, but if you take one look at her, you would know that CF does not and cannot define her. Through all the struggles, she still manages to find roses among the lifetime of thorns. Although each family has a unique CF story, we realized um, that we are not alone. We are a part of this huge CF community where there is a plenty of love for all the families. It doesn't matter what our ethnic background, uh, what ethnic backgrounds we have, everyone's focus is the same, find a cure. Now countless number of hours put in by the researchers, medical professionals, all the hard work by the CF Foundation and, uh, and selfless volunteers have improved the quality of life for the people living with CF by leaps and bounds. Riddhi is one of the 10% of the CF population who do not qualify for modulator. But now we are a part of this big loving family and that's why we can dare to hope. We now hope that yes, there would be a cure for every person living with CF. And yes, they can fulfill their dreams. We pray uh, not just for our own little family, but for all the families who are on this journey with us. Events like this are a great reminder and, all, and also an opportunity to express my gratitude to each and uh, every one of you attending today. Thank you. Now, I would like to pass on to Maura, who would share her CF journey with you all. Thank you so much. I really am happy to be here today. I'm very honored to be speaking with you. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit about my story. Um, like Reedy, actually, I was diagnosed at birth. Um, I had holes in my intestines and had meconium ileus. And, um, <clears throat> When, my was, when I was born, actually, my parents were not aware of cystic fibrosis. So needless to say, um, the diagnosis was a shock to them. Um, living life with cystic fibrosis for me and for my family was normal. It was part of our everyday life. Um, we got to do things that our friends did or our family members did. And our life was, quote unquote, normal. Um, as the disease progressed, I did get sicker. And um, when I was a young mom and married living in New York City, uh, the doctor came in and discussed transplant with me. Um, I really, at that point in time, did not think that a transplant was on the horizon. However, when they came and presented it, I do have to say there was a calmness about it. Um, you know, my husband was there with me. <clears throat> he just happened to, to, to be there. And we felt really calm after speaking to the doctor. Um, that year when I was doing my transplant workup, unfortunately, I got very, very sick. My health declined rapidly. And um, the last portion of the transplant workup was done in an ICU. As you can see from some of the photos, um, I was on ECMO prior to the first transplant. I needed lungs in order to save my life. I was dying. Um, I was transplanted at Columbia Presbyterian in New York City and the doctors and nurses, the team there, I cannot say um, more wonderful things about them. They literally saved my life and I like to say that they put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, you know, the let the life after my first transplant months i lost all my hair i was down to 70 pounds i had to learn to walk again um, i aspirated quite a few times and it was very very difficult i had young children at the time as you can see and we missed birthdays we missed thanksgivings we missed christmases oftentimes they would come to the gift shop to get their presents from mom because I was in the ICU. So a lot of time was spent 
in the ICU and at Columbia Presbyterian, um, not only for those six months post-transplant, but most of that first year after the transplant. Um, then in, on December 30th of 2013, the second call came from my second transplant. And that was a godsend. Um, I do remember the call coming. I was in the ICU at the time. And um, it was the miracle that we were hoping for. We knew that my first lungs were, <clears throat> were kind of a, a life preserver to get me to that second set of lungs that I needed so badly. My first set of lungs actually were rejected from some centers, but my transplant team took them because they knew that I wasn't going to last much longer. The second set of lungs, however, were perfect. Um, I actually remember my transplant doctor coming in on her day off to say that the lungs looked so great and they were so happy. Um, <clears throat> so thus began my journey with a second set of lungs. Um, after waking up in the ICU post-surgery, they get you up out of bed pretty quickly. They want you to start your rehab, start walking, get you off all of your, your ventilators and, and all that good stuff. And I do remember walking around the ICU with my husband and something came over me. It was the first time in my life that I was able to breathe normally. It was not a CF breath. It was not a post first transplant breath. It was a very deep breath and it was rigorous. Really. It was, it was, it was, you know, really hard to keep walking around, but it was also wonderful. Um, just to be able to, to have that feeling. Um, you know, I would say that <clears throat> I always knew having CF that a transplant was probably on the horizon. I certainly did not think that it was going to be in my early thirties. Um, you know, I definitely did not think I was going to need a second transplant. I think that's where the kind of CF is not one size fits all com comes in. Um, you know, throughout my life, like I said, I was extremely healthy. I was into everything my friends were into. Um, there was nothing that we didn't do growing up. I went to college, got a job, um, got married, had children. And um, it was shocking to, to go through, you know, the, the, the transplant workup, et cetera, at such a young age. Um, and then to have a second one so closely after was even a bigger shock. Um, you know, obviously both, both transplants were different, um, but I'm so grateful that I, I had both of them. I would never change my experience. Um, you know, it, it was um, extremely hard, but we always had hope, um, you know, we never lost hope, which was um, was huge for our family. Um, not only my, my, my husband and my children, but also my extended family and my, and my, um, my friends and all the people in the hospital who we actually kind of became family with. And, um, you know, it's interesting to hear people talk about modulators. So, I do remember after one of my transplants, I said to my husband, if I could have just waited, if I could have just not have gotten sick for a few more years and went on and gotten the correct modulator for myself, I probably wouldn't have met, needed the transplant. Um, right now I am on Trikafta. And even though it does not affect my lungs, because my lungs no longer have CF, it does affect my sinuses. It has cleared them thank goodness. And it's allowed me to gain weight, which has been extremely difficult to do just with having CF and also taking a lot of medications for, for transplantation. Um, so that's, that's my story. And, um, you know, I'm so appreciative to be here and speak to you and, you know, give you some insight about transplantation, um, post-transplantation and having CF 
And, um, you know, I, I appreciate you listening. And now I will send it back to Alex. So, Amita and Maura, thank you both so much for sharing your stories with us. I'd also like to do a quick shout out to our planning committee and all of the speakers and facilitators. Thank you so much for giving your time to us over these last few months. We truly could not do these events without you. Now I'd like to introduce a special video by the Sing Spire Virtual Choir, made up of singers of all ages living with cystic fibrosis from around the globe. The Sing Spire Virtual Choir comes together as one voice to defy their diagnosis. Performing original pieces, the Sing Spire Virtual Choir was born from one of the SIA Foundation's first impact grant recipients. Sing Spire is a program by Breathe Bravely, which was founded by Ashley Ballou Banema. I hope you enjoy this original powerful work of art, No One Walks Alone. I think it truly brings together our theme of unity, both from this keynote and all of this family con in general. Once the video concludes, the last sessions of FamilyCon will take place at 6.15 p.m. Eastern, and they will include different activities for participants to focus on their wellness, including a reframing self-care workshop and a panel discussion around gaming and wellness. Thank you all again so much for joining us at 2022 CF FamilyCon. We choose, we're left to chance.